6.53 at Alabama's Morning News, and we've had a decade of, well, really longer than that, but in, in particular, a decade of low interest rates, and it's fueled government spending, reckless government spending, and we're talking with Jack Salmon. He's a contributor with Young Voices. Jack, welcome to the show. Good morning, John. Thanks for having me on. So, so help me understand, why is it that, because you would think low interest rates would be good, but then the government has to react in a way that it damages the economy. Explain how this works. Well, low interest rates are, are good when, when you're um, going into an economic crisis, as, as we were in, in the great financial crisis in 2008, 2009. But they're not so good once you come out of the crisis and you hold them at low rates for a decade or more, as was done from 2010 through 2020. What tends to happen is you get overinvestment, and so you have financial bubbles. And then when, when another crisis does come along, uh, and, and the government spends trillions and trillions of dollars and, and the Federal Reserve then has to monetize all this money. And so you depreciate the value of the currency and we end up with this sky high inflation. And but what's really happened? I was going to say, and that's kind of what happened with during the uh, during the whole pandemic. The government said we're going to pump a bunch of whether they meant to or not. When they kept pumping all that money into the economy while keeping interest rates low, I guess that contributed to the sky high inflation rates we have now. Correct. We often hear from, from politicians that it's, it's, it's all about supply issues. It's, about, um, it's, it's caused by the, the war in Ukraine and things like this. But, but ultimately, the inflation we experienced for the, for the past couple of years has been fiscal inflation. So it's really driven by, by too much government spending, excess savings. And that's why now the Federal Reserve is, is having to hike rates so fast and so high. It's to try and clamp down on, that, on, on those excess savings and that excess demand in the economy to try and bring down that consumption. And it's important to note that that's really what is causing the inflation. It is the government because they're they're driving the inflation up and then they're going to have to try and they're going to have to try and fix it, but they're almost like they're chasing it's like a dog chasing its tail because as much as they try and fix it, then they create other problems that ripple through the economy and then there's then there's downstream issues because they attempt to do things by by adjusting the prime lending rate. That's quite right. And what's worse is that, 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 that they're now having to try and re- reduce this inflation by raising interest rates, but they're not really tackling the, the, the fiscal side of things, that they're still overspending. Uh, we're now forecast to spend another $16 trillion just in, on deficits in the coming decade. And so there's, there's really a, a failure to deal with the underlying problem. Raising interest rates tackles part of the problem, but it really doesn't deal with the the fiscal drivers of inflation, which is what's really been, 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 been driving things in the, in the wrong direction for the past decade. And now with rising interest rates, the cost of, of refinancing all this government debt is, is, is going through the roof. In, in August of this year, for the first time in history, the cost of servicing our federal debt was larger than the cost of, of, of our entire defense budget. What do you think is the end game of this when you talk about the debt? Because we, we hear it, it, it's astronomical. It's in the multi-billions of dollars. I don't even know what it is now, but it just keeps going up and up. At some point, the bill is going to come due, and they can't just keep passing the check around the table. Somebody is going to have to pay this thing. Who and when? Yeah, so that, that, is, that is a very big problem. Um, our, our total stock of debt right now is actually $31 trillion. Uh, is $24 trillion if you just look at the, the debt held by the public. And we're, we're only going to be adding to this. And then if you add on top of that, in about 10 to 12 years' time, the Social Security and Medicare trust funds are both going to be depleted. And so there's going to be an even larger stock of debt added on top of that. What it's going to require is ultimately some bipartisan consensus where both sides are going to have to come together and try to come to some solutions in terms of spending restraint. Now, whether or not we're going to see that is, is an open-ended question, but it was, the, it was fiscal pressure from rising interest rates in the 1980s that actually forced policymakers to come together in the 1990s and, and, and make some spending reductions and to, to eventually balance the book by the end of the 1990s. So it's, it's possible. I, I try to be glass half full in this sense, but it's still an open-ended question. Jack Salmon, thank you so much for joining us. And yes, I guess I guess you're at least sort of half glass half full, but I'm still thinking the, the half empty part is a problem. 